Hi everyone, welcome to the Myler Lab uh, annual workshop, uh, virtual this time. Uh, my name is Shannon Smith, I am a graduate student in the Myler Lab, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about Rosetta Ligand um, and docking. So ligand docking in Rosetta, um, I want to clarify that ligand in this case refers to a small molecule. Um, this ligand docking is typically uh, a part of a drug discovery campaign. Um, that's what we use it for in this case. Um, the goal of ligand docking is simply to obtain one or a small number of potential binding modes um, that a small molecule ligand um, and how it binds to a target protein. And this requires extensive sampling of both the ligand and its different conformations as well as the protein. Um, and that includes side chains, that includes some backbone movements. Um, this image here is just a picture taken from a publication a couple of years ago um, where we helped um, with an MGLU uh, receptor um, in using docking to aid the drug discovery process. So Rosetta ligand history, um, this started back um, with Jens Myler himself. Um, he introduced small molecules into the Rosetta framework, um, allowing uh, us to do this kind of docking simulations. Um, this has been built upon in subsequent years. So um, uh, Davis and Baker allowed more backbone flexibility near the binding site, um, which we will talk about. Um, we'll talk about each of these over the course of, um, of this talk. Um, Lemon and Myler introduced XML scripting into this, which is a really nice interface that you guys have already been introduced to. Um, there is high throughput screening capability within Rosetta, um, and this paper talks about that as well as improving low resolution sampling methods. Um, and then the most recent uh, development project has uh, come from uh, the Myler lab and this Rosetta ligand ensemble, which we won't talk about today. And each of these citations are at the end of the PowerPoint. So when is Rosetta ligand likely to work? So the ideal case would be a crystal structure of your protein um, with the same or a similar ligand. Um, we oftentimes use benchmarking uh, called self-docking, um, and that is simply to see if we can recapture um, the native pose of a ligand bound to its protein structure. Um, so this will obviously work the more rigid the protein is. Um, if there's induced fitting going on, that's just really difficult to simulate. Uh, you're gonna have to sample a lot, a lot more space. So a well-defined pocket, a rigid pocket um, always works better. Um, in small drug-like molecules, um, our score function uh, typically favors more hydrophilic and hydrogen bonding. Um, so we tend to, to simulate those more accurately. Um, and this experimental restraints here, um, just in general, the more knowledge that you have about which residues are interacting with your small molecule based on um, any type of experimental study, um, that can also aid in the docking process as well. So I want to reiterate here that docking is simply to find the binding mode. Um, and this is typically a much easier problem uh, comparatively. It's still a hard problem, but comparatively to uh, predicting activity or predicting binding um, KD values, for example. So you need two things when, when you do uh, protein, um, protein ligand docking in Rosetta. You need a protein model and you need a ligand model. So the protein model will typically consist of a crystal structure um, or another exper experimentally determined structure, so NMR or cryo-EM, um, more so in the recent years. Um, and then comparative modeling techniques, uh, you guys will talk about that during the workshop as well. This is a really powerful method um, to then have uh, ligand docking um, as a starting point from this comparative modeling uh, protocol. Um, typically, it's better to run uh, ligand docking into multiple models. This allows more extensive, extensive sampling. It's more of an ensemble-like representation, which is more similar to what we actually see in nature. So ligand conformer generation, I mentioned earlier that you have to sample extensively both the ligand and the protein. So the ligand side comes from ligand conformers. Um, so what are ligand conformers? They are simply a set of the different geometric conformations that we want to sample. Um, Rosetta does not do conformer generation, but we rely on, instead we rely on other software programs um, 
to do to make these conformers um, and then just containing an SDF file um, of all those individual conformers, um, we can make them Rosetta compatible. Um, and we'll go through that in the actual tutorial itself. So here's a couple uh, ligand confirmation sources. Um, we typically use the BCL, which is also made in the Milo lab, um, but Mo and OpenEye uh, are other uh, softwares in this Frog2 server. So here's some citations for those as well. The ligand params file, this is basically what uh, what Rosetta needs to uh, to understand how to how to read ligand files. Um, think of it this way: so Rosetta typically it has already in its database. Um, it looks at um, the canonical amino acids, um, some con non-canonical amino acids, um, but it doesn't have a database full of um, the uh, nearly endless number of possible drug-like molecules. Um, so we need to make um, these parameter files. Um, for each ligand that we put into Rosetta. So it just knows how to read it. Um, so these params files, you will be generating this in the tutorial, um, but just a brief overview. Um, what's provided in here is just some information about the naming, um, the residue names, the atom names, um, some charging information, um, how the atoms are connected um, and using internal coordinates um, in bond lengths and bond angles, um, some additional properties such as metal binding capability, um, and then the last line also points to your conformer file. Um, but this will all make more sense in the tutorial itself. Um, and this is the path within Rosetta to actually generate this params file. So the Rosetta ligand algorithm overview. Um, this goes from a low resolution mode to a high resolution mode. Um, so we start with our initial placement, which is simply to um, put the ligand in the binding pocket, and then we do what's called a transform, um, and this cycles through on a Monte Carlo uh, basis, um, and then we move into high resolution um, or atomistic um, uh, uh, representation of the protein, um, and we do smaller ligand moves. Um, we also do interface and, and side chain movements here, um, a repacking, so to speak, um, we do some gradient-based minimization uh, to get to a local minimum. Um, and this is done on a, on a Monte Carlo uh, except reject basis. Um, and then we end with a final minimization. I have a note down here that almost everything Rosetta does is Monte Carlo based. Um, so I have a couple slides um, right now to talk about just very basically, um, at a very basic level, what Monte Carlo does. Um, so let's say we're starting from a pose M1. This can be a protein ligand confirmation, uh, just in one specific confirmation uh, at M1. Um, and then we impose a conformational change, which gets us to M2. Um, and this is our energy landscape. So the lower, the better. Um, so this is actually decreasing in energy, which is favorable. So we're going to accept that move. On the other hand, um, we also want to explore a fair amount of conformational space, and we're going to have to go uphill sometimes to do that. Um, so again, if we're starting at M1 and we move to M2 over here, this is an increase in energy on our landscape. Um, but we still don't want to automatically reject that. So what we end up doing is we accept based on the metropolis criteria. Um, so the, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so what this looks like is um, the greater this energetic leap is, um, the lower this, uh, this p-value is going to be. Um, and then we choose a random number between 0 and 1. Um, so the likelihood of actually um, accepting that um, would be greater if you're taking smaller leaps in energetic space. Um, so that's just a simple overview of Monte Carlo. It's a sampling method. It allows you to go um, downhill and also uphill so you can sample larger conformational space. OK, so let's get into the actual Rosetta protocol, the Rosetta ligand protocol. Um, the first step is we actually have to place the ligand into the same coordinate space of the binding pocket. Um, this is a very simple thing. Uh, this uses what's called the start from mover um, to initially place the ligand within the binding pocket. We have it out in space here. We simply want to put it here. It's very simple, very straightforward. Um, it's actually not in the uh, tutorial script. We already have the ligand actually in the binding pocket. Um, so I put um, what it would look like in the XML here. You simply give it um, XYZ coordinates. Um, 
And then it will place the ligand centroid at that specific coordinate. So once we have it actually in the binding pocket, um, we then want to do some larger sampling. So we want to sample um, kind of the full neighborhood of the binding pocket. Um, and this is done using a low resolution transform mover. So we're making these big movements. Um, we want to just sample all over the, the binding pocket. Um, this uses conformer sampling on the ligand side. Um, this is a grid-based uh, Monte Carlo approach. So I'll get into grid-based um, on the following slide. This is very fast. Um, because it's coarse grained, um, which means that it's very, um, it's very simple uh, measurements of whether that's um, a favorable move or not favorable move. Um, we are only looking at Van der Waals, so we're only looking at whether we're essentially bumping into, um, into the protein, uh, which would give us large repulsive um, uh, scores, um, but we also still want to have interactions, so um, we're going to favor some uh, somewhere in the middle there. Um, and this is actually uh, described on this slide. So um, we use this grid-based sampling, which you can see in the, um, in the XML file um, designated as the scoring grid section here. Um, so you can envision this, this grid here. Um, each point has an associated um, uh, Van der Waals score associated with it. Um, and so this makes these calculations very, very quick. Um, so we're going to be moving this ligand all over the place, um, and this grid has already been predefined. So um, you can kind of see this is my drawing. I'm not a very good artist, um, but I was trying to trace the helices here. Um, so basically, we don't want to go into the red here because we're going to be interacting um, with uh, with the helix here um, and around that pocket. It basically defines where we can and cannot go. Um, and you'll notice in the middle where there's not really anything interacting. Um, we also don't want to be there because we do want to be interacting with the protein. Um, so we really want to um, uh, be towards the edge of this boundary here. So um, I want to um, show you guys the XML script um, that we will be using in the tutorial. Um, I would highly encourage you guys to open this up um, in a text editor. Um, to look at because we're going to be going through this over the course of the talk. Um, so here's each of the steps in the process um, and here's the transform mover um, and the different options associated with it. Um, so it might be helpful for just following along. So the transform parameters, um, there are several things that um, Rosetta just basically needs to know how much you want it to sample. Um, so this is dictated by, um, uh, by the box size um, which is given as an option in the XML, um, and also the grid width. So this was defined by the grid um, that, that we saw here, the scoring grid, um, and this width is 15, uh, 15 angstroms. Um, so the box side and the grid width, um, you have to make these um, so that the, uh, the grid has to be bigger than the box. Um, for it to, to sample, or else it'll give you an error. OK, so um, transform. Uh, we call this a transform mover. It originally was translation uh, and rotation as different uh, processes. These have been combined into this transform. Um, but basically, what's happening is that we're sampling uh, translation, which means we're just moving it in XYZ space. Um, and we can do that on a Gaussian distribution between 0 and the move distance. Um, and then rotation similarly, um, given how much um, angle we let it, uh, we let it rotate, we can um, we sample it randomly between zero and that angle. So these Monte Carlo parameters, this Monte Carlo keeps coming back up because uh, this is what we do in Rosetta. Um, so these define the number of cycles that we want it to do, um, the number of repeating cycles, um, and also the temperature. So if you go back to the Monte Carlo slides, there's temperature dependence here. Um, and the higher the temperature, um, the more likely you're going to accept a move. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you were to lower the temperature, the more likely you're not going to accept a move. Um, and then the chain here is designated. We typically use chain X. Um, I only use chain X for this. Um, so I have highlighted here. Um, these are the options that I typically would change um, if I want to sample more or less 
within the binding pocket um, are the box size and, and potentially the grid width as well. Um, this is kind of up to your own discretion, how much you want to sample in the binding pocket. This deals with how much you know about this particular binding pocket. Um, and these are the really the only options that I would go in and change. All the other stuff has been pretty heavily benchmarked by developers. So now we've gone from our transform uh, low resolution stage where we're sampling, um, making big moves within the binding pocket. Um, and now we've settled within a little neighborhood of the binding pocket, so to speak. Um, and now we want to do smaller ligand moves. Um, we really want to better characterize and score the interactions that are taking place. Um, so we're going to use more than just a van der Waals um, uh, score function. Um, so this also follows a similar type Monte Carlo process um, than what we've seen before. So what we would do is move the ligand, um, induce a conformational change, and then we do repacking. Um, so repacking consists of um, uh, testing out different ligand conformers and also sidechain uh, rotomers. Um, then we go into this gradient-based minimization of both the sidechain and the ligand. Um, we get a score and we accept or reject based on the metropolis criteria as described previously. Um, and then we go back and we do this process um, however many times um, we've designated it in the XML. <clears throat> Okay, so this is a slide pretty much saying what I just went through. Um, so um, which residues do we repack? Um, this is a question that um, is defined by the move map. So we'll get into this in just a second. Um, you can also specify a res file, um, which you will see in other tutorials. Um, this is a way to just simply say, I want to sample um, these specific residues around the binding pocket. Um, so what is this move map um, that I'm talking about? Um, so the next couple slides are a visual representation of this. Um, this is defined in your XML script. Um, I would highly recommend that you, uh, you follow there um, because these things link in different parts of the XML. Um, but the ligand area simply identifies um, the cutoffs. So the distance cutoff between, um, between the ligand and um, in the atoms to include in the side chains. So what this means is that we give it a certain distance cut off from any atom in the ligand, um, and then we, um, we define yes or no that that's within that range. Um, so then we expand this. Um, we expand this to include all of the atoms in that particular residue um, that were identified within the ligand area. Um, and this is the interface builder. Um, and then an extension off of this, um, is the uh, is the move map itself? Um, uh, I'm sorry. This is the this is the interface builder. It extends to include the surrounding residues. This allows really for some backbone motions, um, so we can sample a little a um, uh, little bit of induced fit um, by sampling some of the dihedrals um, in the backbone angles. So what this ends up looking like is simply a, a Boolean list. So um, for each residue, you're given um, yes or no, can we sample the side chain? And yes and no, can we sample the backbone? Um, so this is a really neat way for Rosetta to just quickly say yes or no, we can go in and sample this um, and define that move map. So the final minimizer is the um, um, is exactly what it says. It's a gradient-based minimization. Um, of your final um, high resolution Docker uh, pose. So we pretty much just want to obtain a local minimum uh, final structure, excuse me, um, final structure um, uh, based on this move map um, and also based on our score function, we, we want to minimize the pose um, with respect to that. Um, and I noted here that we use a hard repulsive term. Um, this is to remove clashes within our structures. So we don't want um, any sort of uh, repulsive terms, Van der Waals repulsive terms. Um, this is in contrast to um, the previous steps where we were sampling and we, um, the repulsive terms, uh, Van der Waals repulsive term, it's a sharp exponential. So if you get just a little bit too close, um, you get a really, um, a really harsh uh, score from that. Um, and you're never going to accept that move. So, um, when we're just sampling and we want to see if that region of the binding pocket is um, potentially available um, or potentially favorable, um, we don't want to automatically reject it um, simply because it got just a little bit too close. So in this final minimization, we're really trying to reduce a lot of these clashes. 
Um, so how do we actually end up scoring all of these? This is done using the interface score calculator. Um, and this calculates ligand specific scores um, from the bound complex um, versus the separated complex. So we, um, uh, we actually take the final pose um, and as described here, we take the final pose and then we just eject the ligand kind of out into space um, and we score each of these and take the difference. Um, the thing that should come to mind here is, um, well, do you do any sort of repacking or any sort of, um, do you change at all the structure um, once you have ejected the ligand out? Um, actually, we don't. So this is something that is currently being worked on um, trying to improve this method. Okay, so um, some frequently asked questions. Um, how do I analyze docking results? Um, and this is, um, this deserves a, a more than just a one bullet point on one of the final slides, because um, it's a really great question um, and a very important question. Um, but one thing that I, a couple of things that I usually tell people um, are, you know, are you converging onto one or more poses? Um, you can do some cluster-based analyses. Um, you know, are your, um, you'll see some score versus RMSD curves um, in the tutorial that we're going to be doing. Um, so are you seeing a lot of structures um, go into specific um, uh, parts of that funnel? Um, put cluster analysis twice, I'm sorry about that. Um, and then in red here um, are, are some very important points. Um, and it's basically to say, use your own uh, chemical intuition. Um, you should know, um, if you're working on a specific system, you likely know a lot about it. Um, so one thing that, that I've used a lot in the past, for example, is some mutag mutagenesis information, um, whether that's cross-species and there's specific mutations within, in the binding site that are different between the two, um, or looking at um, uh, homologous uh, proteins, proteins in the same family where there's more mutagenesis information and you're looking for specificity. Um, those are examples. I've noticed that those are very helpful with trying to understand and improve docking results. Um, but it just goes to say that really uh, your brain um, is the best judge when you actually go in and you look at these structures, which you really need to do. You really need to go in and look at these things um, because your eye really is the best judge. Okay, off that soapbox now. Um, the other uh, frequently asked questions are how many outputs do I need? Um, this can typically depend on uh, a number of things. Um, the size of your active site. Um, if you're looking in a really big search space, um, you might need to sample more or you might need to have multiple starting points. What about the size of your ligand? How flexible is your ligand? You might need to increase if your ligand is more flexible. Um, depending on your, your conformer library, this could also um, be important. Um, and again, how much information do you have on the binding pocket? So maybe mutagenesis data uh, can give some insights into that. Um, again, looking at cluster analysis as well to see if you've converged on one or a small number of poses can be a good indicator of whether you've sampled enough. Is there high throughput screening capability? So this was actually um, in one of the first slides where I talked about the Rosetta ligand history. Um, the DeLuca paper um, actually went into um, the high throughput screening tools um, available. And how long do docking runs usually take? You'll find out in the tutorial that they're actually very short. Um, so you can run a large number of these and get a lot of outputs very quickly. Here's a couple of references. I'll breeze through these. Um, these are for the methodology. These are the, the ones that I referenced earlier. Um, and then there's a lot of application papers where we've used Rosetta Ligand um, in all sorts of application projects. Um, so the tutorial today is going to be just the standard protein ligand docking protocol. Um, it's described in much more detail in the actual protocol itself. Um, but just an introduction to that, um, we're going to be working with the crystal structure of this D3 uh, receptor. Um, and we're going to be doing a little bit of analysis. Um, and uh, with that, I guess I'll turn it over and let's get going. Thanks, guys. <laughs>